Before we start this video, I just want to let you know that we will be going on the assumption that you have played all the Arkham games. So beware for spoilers ahead. I'd also like to give a big shout out to our gold tier patrons, A Beat, Bossian, Christopher, Cypress Husky, Frank Riff, and Pyrite. Thanks so much guys, and I hope you enjoy the video. Chances are if you're interested in video games or Batman, then you've heard of the explosive success of the Arkham Trilogy. When Arkham Asylum was announced, there was a lot of skepticism and overall anxiety surrounding the game's release because, at the time, quality superhero games were a scarce commodity. When the game came out, it was like the whole world, including my younger self, let out a sigh of relief and then subsequently a roaring cheer. It had established a combat system that rewarded rhythm and a stealth system that rewarded skill and patience. Couple this with the setting of the game which resembled a haunted island both literally and figuratively, and you have a game that set the bar for all other action games to come after, whether they were superhero based or not. Following up such an impactful game would prove to be a tall order, and upon the release of Arkham Asylum's sequel, Arkham City, we knew that we had again been blessed with a quality Arkham game. The combat and stealth were expanded upon, the size and scope of the story and world also saw some improvements. At this point, the game's developers Rocksteady were two for two, and were steadily working on the final entry to the Arkham series, Batman Arkham Knight. Upon Arkham Knight's release, it was immediately surrounded by controversy to the point that it nearly overshadowed the game itself. Problems with the story and the fans to test for the Batmobile were hoisted as high as possible while letting the extensive, improved, and perfected stealth and combat to rot with the game's other fantastic traits such as the graphics and animations that still look good over half a decade later. I made a video on my channel attempting to point out where Arkham Knight succeeds and you can find that video in the description. So you may have noticed that I left a particular Batman game out, and since you've read the title and thumbnail then you know where I'm going with this. People often refer to the Arkham games as the Arkham Trilogy, being Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, and Arkham Knight. The reason for this is because of the release and reputation of Batman Arkham Origins. Arkham Origins was developed by Warner Brothers Montreal and released in the long period between Arkham City and Arkham Knight, while Rocksteady developed the series finale. Since its release, it has been seen as this ugly duck in the series and it still has its fair share of hate. In fairness, it's not like people were grabbing their torches and pitchforks claiming it was a terrible game, but there was and still is a sense of disappointment. Of course, this game isn't perfect, and I don't want this video to only talk about the strengths of this game, but also examine where the game went wrong and what impacts it had on the game itself. I also want to clarify that this video is just my thoughts and opinions. I don't mean this as a shield from criticism, but as a reminder that it's okay to disagree. So please, don't think that I'm trying to present myself as woke or superior just because I like a video game. I do, however, want this video to ignite some sort of respectful and friendly discussion, so let's try and respect each other's opinions and not insult each other in the comments section. So with that being said, let's take a look at Batman Arkham Origins. I think as far as graphics go, they were pretty good. <laughs> I don't want to speak too much on it because as far as the lighting and texture quality goes, it all looks acceptable. Not necessarily top of the line for the standards of the time in which this game came out, or even today's standards, but ultimately, it works. I played on PC and I found that the game ran quite well with little frame drops, however, my game crashed twice while doing side quests and I had one instance of a cutscene in which I fell through the map. Alright, only one more of those suckers left. I gotta say, working together is kind of fun. I mean, we're actually getting stuff done. And my dad thinks I'm just sitting in his office texting and watching TV. If only he knew. So while playing on PC wasn't the worst experience, I was told by a few of you lovely viewers that the game was near bug free on consoles. So if you can, it would be best to play this on your Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3. Character designs look awesome, with some villains like Black Mask looking just as you imagine they would, and characters like Batman, Joker, and Bane having redesigns that will surely please. Batman's suit is much heavier than in previous games, with more plated armor rather than the spandex we see in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. We also have new voice actors for both the Batman and the Joker by Roger Craig Smith and Troy Baker respectively. Troy Baker does a pretty good job as the Joker, but Roger Craig Smith absolutely kills it as Batman. I actually enjoy his performance more than Kevin Conroy's performance as the Dark Knight in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Maybe not as good as Conroy's performance in Arkham Knight, but Roger Craig Smith still definitely knocks it out of the park here. Not out of jealousy, not out of anger. You did it because you're a small, selfish, malicious- Sir, is everything alright? Your vital signs are rather erratic. One thing I must mention is that the choice to have some pre-rendered cutscenes in the game was, in my opinion, not a great choice. While they may have looked decent at the time, it unfortunately aged like a jug of milk in the sun. Compressed and near mosaic visuals are the most egregious examples of the antithesis of eye candy. Locking the frame rate to 30 FPS can on one hand allow these pre-rendered cutscenes to have a cinematic feel, however when contrasted with the slick 60 FPS gameplay, it comes across as all too jarring. 
Since we are on the topic of cutscenes, we should talk about the cutscenes rendered in real time. These cutscenes look really good, with the camera angles doing a spectacular job at intensifying the fear of God that the Cape Crusader likes to put into his foes. The camera likes to move in a slick motion for cutscenes, but one thing that doesn't always move smoothly are the characters. In some of the dialogue interactions, characters will snap their head to where they need to be for the animation, and it comes off as really jarring as seen here. It doesn't happen so much as to annoy or affect your experience, however, it did happen often enough for me to at least mention it here. Lip syncing and just about everything else was quite good, however, it's neither exceptional nor detestable. The dialogue scenes unfortunately still suffer from the talking head syndrome seen in previous Arkham games, but it was a slight improvement over the previous games. As far as gameplay animations go, it definitely shares animations from both Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. The recycling of both ideas and animations is unfortunately a trend that shows up a lot in this game. This of course isn't a new phenomenon as Arkham City recycled animations from Arkham Asylum while adding all new animations, and the same can be said for Arkham Origins. I will try to point them out as they become relevant rather than dedicate an entire section to it. Basic attacks and counters are reused, but there's some new ones mixed in with the flurries of punches and flying kicks. Bruce within the context of this game is still new to the whole vigilante thing and his anger often gets the best of him, which is shown through the brutal animations. This also applies to the stealth and traversal. Like I said before, I don't want to focus on the graphics and animations too much, so I'll clarify and confirm that no matter what you do in this game, be that beating down thugs through combat or stealth, or evading the slithering copperhead as she slinks and slips through pipes, it's gonna look pretty good. As far as the combat goes, it functions just as it did in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, however here in Origins, there's a refined sense of flow and brutality here. While there are a few new moves for Batman to perform, he does have at least one new gadget which is this game's version of the Line Launcher which is obtained from Deathstroke. It works like the tethers in Just Cause 3. You shoot one end of the tether to an enemy and the other end to another enemy, or an interactable. New enemy types are introduced here too, such as the martial artists. These guys can actually counter your attacks, and if you want to take them down you will have to counter their counters. These enemies solve the big issue with the Arkham franchise, which is the good old button mashing criticism. The game does reward you for punching with a certain rhythm, however, now you have to counter with timing, as when these martial artists attack you, they'll play a number of different animations with different counter timings associated with them, meaning that you need to be somewhat patient when trying to counter them. Failing to counter in time will of course leave you with a few bruises, and spamming triangle will reset your combo. I like the way these martial artist enemies spice up the combat, as they help me break the habit of just spamming the hell out of triangle when seeing that incoming attack icon. There are also Venom-infused enemies that serve to be like a little baby Bane. To clarify, Venom is a precursor chemical to Titan. These guys can charge at you and upon doing so will lock you from behind, and you have to mash A in order to get out. Meanwhile, other thugs will try to attack you while you're in this lock. In order to take these guys down though, you have to perform either two beatdowns or two special combo takedowns. Upon doing so, they'll come down from their enraged state and can be subsequently taken down as though they were a normal enemy. There's one more gadget that you get throughout your playthrough and it acts as quite the double-edged sword. The Electrocutioner's Gloves are a tool that becomes charged the more you attack enemies, with higher combos offering more efficient charging. Once it hits its threshold, you can unleash a barrage of electrifying slaps that leave enemies down for a longer time and ignore defenses such as armor or riot shields. On top of that, this gadget can be a lifesaver in boss fights as it does additional damage to your foes. So while on one hand, it's a super useful tool for when you're overwhelmed, and even more useful for when you want to quickly clear out a room or a group of enemies surrounding a boss, but it unfortunately serves as an instant win method. So many encounters and even boss fights can be cheesed by just spamming the shock gloves, and that's assuming you don't have any of the upgrades. With upgrades, it became so powerful that I ended up just not using it in order to keep myself challenged. This is not me trying to get on my high horse about needing a challenge in video games, but it's a matter of feeling like I was cheating, or lowering the difficulty. Thankfully, it really felt like the enemy's AI in this game has seen a more aggressive alteration, as enemies will not hesitate to swarm you and throw multiple punches. Arkham Asylum and Arkham City often felt like the guards were just surrounding you and each taking their sweet time to telegraph an attack. They definitely still telegraph their attacks, however, it seems like they follow through with their attacks in a faster fashion, which could be jarring for some diehard Arkham Asylum and Arkham City fans. My only real issue with the combat is its lack of innovation. I just felt like I wanted more of it. The new mechanics and gadgets they added were a great addition, however, I felt like some more mechanics would not have hurt. I assume the reason the improvements in the game are so limited is because Rocksteady were already adding these improvements to Arkham Knight, and Warner Brothers Montreal was probably restricted with what they could and couldn't add, as Arkham Knight, in my opinion, exhausted all the possible enemy types. This unfortunately doesn't change the fact that there could have been some newer changes made to the combat. Fortunately though, that doesn't change the fact that there were still some good improvements to the combat, and the combat overall still feels as good as ever. I would say that the combat in this game is just as good as Arkham City, but not necessarily better. The changes made to the combat make it feel a tad bit more fresh, but not enough for me to make a definitive statement on which game has the best combat pre-Arkham Knight. 
Stealth follows this theme of having slight alterations that ultimately improve on the gameplay. The mechanics you loved from older games such as the inverted takedowns and the instant loud takedowns are here and function just as you remember it, but the only real changes are dependent on your new gadgets, being the concussion grenade and the new line launcher. The line launcher works much like the way it did in combat, and it can be used to tether enemies together. You could also tether an enemy to a propane tank, leading to a totally non-lethal explosion that coats the area in a thick cloud of smoke. One thing that this game does have which somewhat separates itself from the other Arkham games is of course the levels where the stealth takes place. Different settings such as the Gotham Bank offer different vantage points, and the aesthetics and predator rooms within the hotel are fantastic. I wish I had more to say about the stealth, but unfortunately there isn't much to say at all. It's similar enough to Arkham Asylum and Arkham City that it still feels spectacular and it's a ton of fun, but it doesn't do much to separate itself from the other games. While the different settings were nice and offered a great change of scenery, the gameplay itself is ultimately the same. I want to clarify that this is not a bad thing by any means, but I wouldn't say it's a point in the game's favor. It's just more of what you loved. The traversal in this game is again much like Arkham City as you have the grapnel boost. I know that canonically speaking Batman shouldn't have the boost until Arkham City, but I'm totally okay with him having it here as it's borderline essential for moving around and it would hinder the game if we didn't have it. One of the many issues I had with Arkham City was the design of the world. It had this horseshoe design that made backtracking, which happened quite frequently, a bit of a pain since the glider never went too fast. Thankfully, I never thought that I would want this in a Batman game with the cape being one of the most iconic modes of traversal, but the fast travel system is a welcome addition. The map this time around is more in the shape of a bone, with two major islands being connected by a long bridge, and while getting from point A to point B isn't too slow, it feels beyond sluggish when you compare it to Arkham Knight's gliding, which saw you moving faster than the Batmobile. Since we are on the topic of the map, I should let you know that you probably found a portion of this map quite familiar, and that is because it's the same portion of Gotham present in Arkham City. This portion of the map, however, hasn't been nearly destroyed like it was in Arkham City. I found that the map was familiar enough with recognizable landmarks such as the Ace Chemicals building, however, there are enough changes to where it feels different. Of course, there is also an entire brand new island for you to explore, however, well, there isn't much to explore. A lot of the building's rooftops are strangely inaccessible to the Dark Knight, and the entire city can really feel like a maze even on a new game plus. I imagine the reason for this is that there are so many buildings that are too tall to be grappled to. Having tall buildings in an open world is fine as they can serve as a landmark for players learning the map, however, when a majority of the buildings cannot be seen from above, it means your view is almost always obstructed by a building. I think this is what prevents you from feeling familiar with the map to its fullest extent. As much as I don't like the design of Arkham City's open world, I have to admit that the layout was burned into my brain with major landmarks defining each district after a single playthrough. I believe another thing that hinders this world in the design is that all the buildings look very samey. Well, the buildings themselves don't look the same, but everything is covered in a thick layer of snow. Every building has a layer of white on the top, and this goes for the ground too, and while it looks great, it didn't do the world any favors when it comes to distinguishing the different buildings and districts. I think this could have been solved had the streets and buildings of Gotham been given some more characteristics to separate themselves. They could have lifted the snow a little bit so that the different rooftops and the streets are a little more visible, and maybe some more neon signs would help. If each district had its own style, it would be able to keep the map more recognizable and subsequently more memorable. The only parts I do remember are some of the different landmarks and of course the massive bridge which separates the two islands. Now I'm not saying that the map design is bad, but I think compared to the older games it's probably the worst of the bunch. Again, just because it is in my opinion the weakest of the maps doesn't mean that it's bad, but merely it's a 7 or an 8 out of 10 while Arkham Asylum and Arkham City has a map that's like a 9 or a 10 out of 10. I still enjoyed roaming around the world, but I actually found myself using fast travel a lot more than I thought I would, as the gliding just felt a little slow. I assumed the reason the gliding was slow was because the game would need to load all the buildings as you enter new areas, and entering these new areas too fast could cause some performance issues. Unfortunately, having the fast travel didn't encourage me to explore the map as much, but at the same time, going back and forth across that bridge was a huge pain. When fast traveling, there is a quick cutscene, unfortunately pre-rendered, that shows you grappling up to the Batwing, and there's a loading screen where we see Batman sitting in the Batwing, and I don't know why, but it just felt so funny to imagine what Batman's doing in there. What's he listening to? Regardless, fast travel is a welcome addition and I hope it shows up in future games. The interiors of the buildings look great and despite good looking Arkham interiors being expected, I still think it's worth praising. The hotel lobbies and the miniature carnival the Joker builds within the Gotham Hotel look awesome. Penguin's ocean-bound hideout The Final Offer looks like it's splitting apart at the seams and the portion of the game at Blackgate Prison and parts of GCPD really instilled that claustrophobic feeling that we saw most notably in Arkham Asylum. 
Each district has its own major interior that can be seen as the area's dungeon, and working through these is awesome as it gives you some tight-knit settings and environments for you to sneak around. So while the open world itself may not be as memorable as others, the interior environments more than make up for it. The gadgets you would normally expect from Arkham Asylum, like the explosive gel and the triple batarangs, make an appearance, and even gadgets from Arkham City are here too, like the before mentioned grapnel boost and the freeze grenade. Origins did still try to fit the gadgets in without breaking too much continuity, so the freeze grenade is instead the glue grenade. I personally didn't mind this because I feel that if they kept certain gadgets from the player due to the continuity, the game would ultimately feel pretty limited. It already feels limited in the traversal department, so thankfully they made the grapnel boost available from the start, even though I believe it shouldn't technically be there. Boss fights, however, are where this game really shines. There are quite a few original bosses, and some that feel a little too familiar. Deathstroke was easily my favorite boss fight in the game, however, there were clear elements of it borrowed from the Rouse Al Ghul fight in Arkham City. I also think that figuring out the battle can be a little strange for new players. When I first played this game, I just sort of fumbled through the fight by countering and punching, and despite my 13-year-old self just spamming through the fight, it still Look like I knew exactly what I was doing, even if I barely understood the mechanics of the game. Nowadays, however, I understand that there is a lot more complexity to the fight outside of the flashy animations. Deathstroke doesn't like to be cornered, and as such, he'll flip you over if you get too close to a wall. In order to keep the pressure on, you want to try and position yourself in a way that keeps him as far away from a wall as possible, so that whatever combo you get going can continue for as long as possible. If you get a high enough combo, performing a special combo takedown can do a larger amount of damage to the assassin, and performing multiple counters in a row with good timing will result in the same. I appreciated that if you simply spam triangle, it would fail the pseudo quick time event. Eventually, Deathstroke even uses the line launcher, which is pretty cool as it shows you how you could possibly use it in battle. He does eventually attack you with a flurry of sword swipes, and this almost looks like a one-to-one -one copy of the same move that Ra's al Ghul pulled on you in Arkham City, and it's unfortunately dealt with the same way in that you just tap triangle. That however is my only criticism with the fight, and even then, it doesn't change the fact that this fight was awesome. Another great fight was the beginning fight against Killer Croc. Killer Croc's boss fight was interesting because it was in direct contrast to the encounter we had with Croc in Arkham Asylum. In Arkham Asylum, we needed to sneak around and evade Croc, while in this encounter we take him head on and use his own tactics against him. You win the fight by stunning and performing a beatdown on him until eventually he tries to throw an explosive barrel at you, which you can literally blow up in his face if you throw some batarangs at him. This fight was thankfully easy enough mechanically to be approachable for beginners as it literally happens within the first 10 minutes of gameplay, but on subsequent playthroughs when you know what you're doing, you can end this fight quite quickly. When testing different graphic settings and recording settings for my PC, I replayed the first 10 minutes of the game about 7 times, so I can say from experience that this fight is definitely still entertaining upon multiple playthroughs. Copperhead, while being a really neat villain, has a pretty basic horde-like boss fight. On the bright side, the visuals surrounding this fight were nice and it was reasonably challenging too, but nothing special. Bane is a boss you fight three times, well, technically twice. The first two times you fight him, he functions the exact same way, but the third time you face him is really interesting. Before I get ahead of myself, let's talk about the first way you fight him. It's a classic one-on-one -on -one duel within a library that eventually leads to a rooftop. His fight is quite basic as he charges up with his venom, and you take him down by waiting for him to tire himself out, then ultra-stunning him so you can beat him down. I do have a slight issue with his charging attack. When he juices himself up with the venom, he begins to charge at you, and you're supposed to double-tap X to jump out of the way, however, he often tracks you far too well. If you move too early, then he'll adjust his charge and hit you, however, if you try to evade too late, then you just won't get out of the way in time. I feel like the window for you to properly dodge this attack is too small and I ended up just avoiding it altogether by just doing laps around the hulked out luchador. The second time you encounter Bane, it's the same fight as in the library, but this time in a different setting. However, the third time you encounter him, Instead of being in a close encounter toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Venomized supervillain, it's a stealth-based boss fight akin to the Mr. Freeze boss fight in Arkham City. Due to an overdose of Venom, Bane becomes a massive muscular monstrosity and will absolutely maul us if we don't stick to the vents and corners. I enjoyed that because Bane can essentially delete your health bar, and since he's so massive, this fight ends up being pretty intense and at one point even pretty scary. Once Bane's health gets low enough, a jammer will prevent you from using detective vision, and when this happens, you can only trust the booming sound of his footsteps to tell where he is. I wish the whole fight was like this, as the anxiety I felt when hiding an event and not knowing exactly where Bane was, only for him to show up and pull my ass out, only to throw me across the hallway, was like nothing else in the Arkham series. This is because Bane, despite being right out of his mind, is still pretty smart and he'll check the floor grates and the vents to find out where you are, and not being able to see if he's right outside where you're hiding is just… I'm telling you man, it's good. 
Firefly is a pretty good boss fight as it takes place on a near destroyed Gotham Bridge. While the setting surrounding this boss fight is spectacular, the actual method of taking this boss down is a combination of just throwing glue grenades and batarangs. It'd be cool if there were propane tanks lying around the map, and you could use your line launcher to tether it to Firefly, allowing for him to be stunned. Upon stunning him, perhaps he could lose control and land on the ground, leaving an opening for you to perform a beatdown. Overall though, this fight was really good. Unfortunately, despite the plot of this game surrounding eight assassins coming after the Dark Knight's pointy-eared head, we only fight five of them. Well, six if you count Electrocutioner, and I mean that wasn't really a fight despite it being hilarious. Deadshot and Shiva are left as side quests, and not very good ones at that. The side quests in this game are for the most part pretty short. Deadshot is a matter of reconstructing a crime scene and then heading to the Gotham Bank where he has a hostage. This boss fight unfortunately uses the same tactic as the Two-Face boss fight in Arkham City, in that it has respawning enemies. I found it pretty annoying to be honest since it sort of removed any point in taking down the thugs surrounding Deadshot in the first place. Deadshot goes down relatively easy outside of the respawning enemies and the side quest as a whole was just okay if a little short. Shiva is an assassin that does not in fact want to kill you but test you to see if you're worthy to join the League of Assassins. Her tests are pretty neat if again pretty short and her boss fight is pretty whatever. Sorry for not going into too much detail, but as far as her boss fight goes, there isn't much which separates her from a normal enemy aside from her large health bar and the ability to dodge most of your attacks. Penguin has some weapon caches hidden around the city, and taking them out will further your relationship with Barbara Gordon, but unfortunately the side mission generally feels like busy work. It doesn't take too long, but I was only in it for the dialogue. Upon finishing this mission, you unlock a mission from Commissioner Gordon. Here you have to round up some escaped prison inmates, and again, this feels much like busy work, but the dialogue is pretty much what you're here for. Unfortunately for me, the mission bugged out. Whenever there was dialogue, I ended up just hearing Batman get cut off. Go. 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 So, yeah, not a ton of fun for me. Black Mask has some drug stashes around the city, and this quest is quite similar to the Penguin's Weapon Cache side quest. After destroying all of Black Mask's stashes, you find him in the church, which just felt like a normal encounter since Black Mask goes down like a normal thug. This theme persists into the bird side quest, which sees you dropping into these massive gang fights which are being fought over Venom. After stopping a few of these scuffles, you eventually encounter Bird who is Bane's lieutenant. He again goes down like any other enemy, so for me the side quest felt pretty basic. Anarchy is a villain not yet seen in an Arkham game, and I enjoyed his character and his side mission. His side mission sees you having to stop the bombs planted around the city, and upon doing so you face off against him in the courthouse and despite having a health bar he goes down in about half a second. The reason I liked his character is because he, much like a few others, challenges Batman's goals and motivations. He explains that all Batman does is take the law into his own hands so he can throw criminals into a justice system that clearly doesn't work and doesn't keep criminals behind bars. You're a hypocrite. Running around dispensing justice, telling people what they can and can't do. You're ensuring Gotham's freedom, provided it conforms to your twisted view. The prisons don't serve as a place for rehabilitation, but instead as a place where criminals are thrown into for a short period of time while the guards are just as bad as the criminals themselves. When taking down some of the escaped inmates, they explain that Blackgate Prison is a hellhole and that they're just abused there. Do you know what they'll do to me back at Blackgate? The guards are worse than the prisoners. Party's over. You're going back to Blackgate. Please! No! It's horrible there! Don't send me back! I've really enjoyed this theme throughout the game of the justice system being broken. It felt like it paralleled some of the discussions around rehabilitation within our own world. I of course don't want to get political here, but it's an interesting concept within Gotham that I'm happy got some attention here. The Mad Hatter has a great side quest that while being quite short and while it did break halfway through for me, it was still really fun and reminiscent of the Scarecrow encounters from Arkham Asylum. I think this was my favorite encounter with the Hatter in the series for its psychedelic visuals alone. You were very cordially, 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 you were very cordially invited to a party. And it will be a grand affair, grand affair, grand affair, and it will be a grand affair hosted by the Hatter. We do hope that you can come. You can come. You can come. We, we do, do hope, hope that, that you, you can, can come to share in all the joy. Finally, let's talk about the Riddler. In this game, he isn't called the Riddler, and I think it's a little hilarious how he gets his name of Enigma. Think of me as a great big mystery, one you're never going to solve. Enigma, then. Oh, you must think you're so clever. Enigma has hacked a lot of the relay points for the Batwing, which disables your fast travel. 
After unlocking all of them, you can get to his hideout, and upon arriving, you see that you have to disable all of his relay points in order to take down his operation. This operation is actually pretty reasonable. He's just blackmailing corrupt people as a form of punishment and justice. He even makes the argument to Batman that at least he's just destroying the careers of these corrupt people rather than destroying their teeth. After taking down the relay points, you can shut down his servers and effectively close the case. However, there are still data packs hidden throughout the city that are much like the Riddler trophies in the previous games. These data packs contain juicy bits of lore and finding them is much easier since you can have them marked on the map. The downside to this is that getting these packs is never a challenge. I mean, there was not a single data pack that took more than a few seconds to reach, and this is coming from a guy who plays games like an enraged gorilla on a good day. There's also a strange absence of the actual riddles. I can assume this is probably because Enigma is yet to take on the title of the Riddler, but I still wish they were here. Half the time, it seems like the challenge of getting these data packs is just finding them, and when they're marked on the map, it just feels cheap. Don't get me wrong, I like that they marked them on the map, but I wish they were at least somewhat challenging, such as the ones in Arkham City, Arkham Asylum, and Arkham Knight. Here, it's less of a test of intelligence and more of a test of patience. I must admit though, finding them all does give you a really awesome easter egg. Upon finding all the data packs, you get access to Riddler's secret room where we see his gamer setup and a few prototypes of the pressure pads that he has littered throughout the city. Upon breaking a wall in the corner of the room, however, we come across a room which shows some of the cages present in the later Arkham games and even a Riddler trophy that we can pick up. This felt like such an oh shit moment and it really felt rewarding, especially considering the ludicrous amount of experience you get for picking this thing up. Sorry, I know I'm gushing a lot about this, but I love easter eggs like this and this game is chock full of them. Another downside to this mission, unfortunately, is that you don't really hear from Enigma as you work through his side quest. I mean, the best part about getting these trophies in the other games was the way the Riddler would lose it as you got closer and closer to beating him. Here, after you collect all the data packs, you get nothing, at least no dialogue, and it just felt a little empty. Anywho, I think the side quests here were okay. I mean, don't get me wrong, some side quests like the Mad Hatter and Anarchy missions were really good, but a lot of the side missions felt forgettable, or just more like busy work. I think the side missions in both Arkham Knight and Arkham City were more rewarding, however the moment to moment gameplay here was enough to at least warrant playing through these side quests at least once. Okay, finally, let's talk about the story. The story is definitely the most controversial part of the game, and I can definitely see why. So my biggest issue is of course with the Joker. He is still the best villain in this game, and the moments with him are awesome, and he even gets some great development, along with the development of his relationship with Batman. We also see the seeds of his relationship with Harley here too. Unfortunately, Harley in this game just isn't packing the typical dump truck, so I'm sorry boys, but this means the game has to receive a 0 out of 10 for me. Anywho, despite the Joker still being an awesome villain, it really felt like he should have been left out of this game. It would have been cool to have another one of Batman's rogues gallery in the spotlight, and having someone like Black Mask feels perfect. Having Joker in the game not only completely pushes Black Mask to the side, both figuratively and literally, as he is a side quest, but it also undermines the ending of Arkham City. It's like the Joker never died. Hell, even in Arkham Knight, the Joker was still with you and overshadowed the main villains. I think it would have been better had the Joker been left to a post credit scene where Batman gets a call about a bank robbery by a guy named the Joker. Thankfully, Bane plays a pretty big role in the story too, and I think that's great, as he truly is a match for Batman rather than a polar opposite like the Joker is. I like the way Batman is challenged in the story by Bane not only physically, but mentally. His actions are challenged and argued by Alfred on multiple occasions, and I appreciated some of the dialogue surrounding Bruce's nightly escapades. Master Bruce, Bruce, you I will not in good conscience allow you to go. You're outmatched by these assassins. What? You're not some hardened vigilante. You're a young man with a trust fund and too much anger. You're in over your head and I... I don't want this to be your end. Bruce and Alfred have a really good relationship here that we don't get to see in any of the other games. Alfred even has some words of wisdom if you talk to him after some major story events. Sir, if I may, how did Waylon Jones come to be the way he is? Atavism from the look of it. An unfortunate genetic mutation. He even has a few lines which seem to be pretty foretelling of the game's reception. All part of the human condition, I suppose. We have a tendency to fear, often outright despise, that which is different. Ah, oh, but... You already knew that. It was nice seeing the different ways Bruce came into contact with his allies like Barbara and Gordon. Gordon's arc in this game is really well done, as at first he has a near hatred for the Cape Crusader, but by the end of the game, they're uneasy allies. Barbara even explains how mad her dad would be if he found out that Barbara was working for Batman, and if you've played Arkham Knight, then you know how well that went. 
I also appreciated that there was an actual threat to Batman's identity. This was the first game in the series to actually have a villain act on the knowledge of the Batman's true identity, aside from Arkham Knight. Bane legitimately goes to his house and basically tears the place apart, and seeing this consequence was pretty refreshing. At this point in Batman's career, he's still new to crime fighting, and he's still seen as a myth to criminals, so seeing this reflected within the story too was so badass. What the? Where are the hostages? You, you seeing this? What the hell is it? A Polish even in the first scene at Blackgate, they talk about how he isn't supposed to be real, and the camera reflects this as it focuses on the shadows that Batman projects. Batman is also quite brash in the game and hasn't refined his crime fighting style yet, which leads to some pretty interesting story moments. I think the story here could be my favorite in the series, as it achieves what it tried to do even if I don't agree with the direction that the story went with the Joker. I would have personally preferred a Black Mask centered story, but the one they told with the Joker was still good and further showed the origins of their duality. So while the story didn't do anything special or outlandish, it still ended up being pretty good. I think that while this game has some flaws, it's still an awesome Batman game. I think the real issues arise when looking at the game from the standpoint of a sequel. It didn't do much to separate itself gameplay-wise from Arkham City. Sure, they added some new gadgets and a few new enemies, but I couldn't help but feel like I was playing an expansion for Arkham City. If Arkham Asylum was Batman number one and Arkham City was Batman number two, then it felt like Origins was more of a Batman 2.5 than a full Batman 3. The story was definitely a highlight, along with some of the boss fights, which could be argued as some of the best in the franchise, but this game also consists of some of the most boring side missions I've played in any Arkham game. I've heard that the DLC for this game was quite good, however, that's for another video. Even if it doesn't do a ton to expand the gameplay as a sequel, it certainly does a lot to expand the lore and the world of the Arkham series. Despite this, Arkham Origins is still a fantastic game that is ultimately more of what you love. I still recommend you play this game despite what bad things you may have heard and despite the criticisms I have for it, because even if the game has some boring side missions and even if it doesn't do much to separate itself from the other games, its main campaign is top notch and well worth your time and I think it's still a worthy Batman game. So even if it doesn't do much to separate itself from the other games gameplay wise, I still think it's definitely a fantastic Batman game and one that you should definitely play if you haven't already. Hi there, thank you for making it to the end of this uh, video. I know this is kind of a different video because most of my videos tend to have a bit of a uh, thesis behind them, but this was more of just a general thoughts and opinions, which I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I just felt like, you know, felt like it was different. I'm not sure uh, if you guys really like this style or not. I plan to cover more of the Arkham games. I want to obviously cover Arkham City and the DLC for both this game and Arkham City at some point. Right now, I'm working on uh, on a Assassin's Creed Brotherhood video. I have about a page and a half of the script for that done. I have all the, all the footage that I need. And yeah, I want to I want to shout out the patrons again. AB Bosian, Christopher, Cypress Husky, Frank Riff, Pyrite, Avery, Jacob, Denzel, Tristan White Wolf and Tyler. I really appreciate you guys for uh, supporting me. It means a lot. Um, and if you guys want to support me further, you can share my videos on Twitter, Reddit, wherever, Facebook, yada yada. Uh, that would help. Also leaving a like and commenting would be great. If you've made it this far into the video, you should probably just subscribe. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you can check out my other videos in the description. You can follow me on Twitter at ThatBoyAqua. And um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, all I got. One more thing, actually. Nam12399 has a video on Persona 4 out right now, and it is banging, okay? It's like two hours, okay? It's kind of long, but it's really good. I'm telling you, it's well worth your time. Go check it out if you can and tell them that I sent you. Okay, that's all I got for now. I love you guys, and I will see you guys next time.